Thanks, Divya. Thank you so much. Building innovation muscle. So this has uh, almost been a topic for, for ages for all of us. What I would like to do over the next few minutes is actually explore the question of why. Why do we need to build this innovation muscle and why, why especially now? So let me start with, I thought the best way to start this discussion uh, is actually by stepping back and looking at uh, uh, a familiar uh, innovation adoption life cycle that we've all seen before. And we also know Jeffrey Moore uh, took this further, a step further and postulated uh, that a chasm exists between early and mainstream adopters of disruptive new innovations. Due, primarily due to vastly different goals of adoption of the two segments uh, of market. So the early adopters seek innovation and differentiation while the mainstream adopters, the early majority that is, desire practical ROI based solutions. So in order for a technology or an innovation to bridge this chasm, it must appeal to these mainstream adopters by becoming more mature and pragmatic, and as a consequence, less exciting to those on the cutting edge. Strong economies in times of uh, when the in times of economic boom increase uh, uh, increase we see an increase of both supply and demand for pre chasm technologies. So on the demand side, you have solid financials of companies and easy access to cash give them the willingness and the ability to invest significantly in experimenting with pre and technologies that promise growth and also differentiation for them in the market. So the demand is in turn met with an abundant supply of venture capital backed startups promoting these novel, innovative, new technologies and companies. And, the, and also the strong economy and easy access to money also creates inertia within companies to increase efficiency uh, by adopting more proven post chasm technology. So this results in companies placing a higher premium on growth versus efficiency. And there is a strong internal resistance during times of during boom times to change when things are going so well. So now let's see what happens uh, when things are not so good. So a recession, let's say an economic recession hits. And we are seeing that, we saw that when COVID-19 hit, we see the exact opposite. Technologies that are more mature and have clear ROI, that is the post chasm technologies, are more widely adopted as a means to increase operational efficiency uh, and increase investment in these post chasm technologies, steepen the adoption curve decreasing the time to full penetration in the market. So e-commerce, virtualization, cloud are all examples of these uh, post-CASM technology. And on the flip side, pre-CASM uh, new innovations see decreased investment and hence a flattening out of the adoption curve, resulting in a longer delay before mainstream adoption happens of new disruptive technologies. And also on the far right, uh, for aging technologies, we see an accelerated, uh, the accelerated adoption of uh, uh, ROI driven post chasm technologies uh, displaces spending on these aging uh, capital inefficient solutions, which uh, hasten their decline. So now with this, uh, context, given all this data, the reaction would be to focus on operational efficiency and cost optimization when something like COVID hits. And that's exactly what happened two years, a year and a half back when COVID-19, the first wave happened. Uh, all companies or most companies, many companies um, uh, flip, changed towards uh, focusing on cost efficiency, cost reduction, operational efficiency, and so on and so forth. But then history has taught us that through several downturns, there's clear demonstrated evidence that companies that continue to innovate through the down cycle, win in the market and achieve leadership position. So on the screen are all examples of all companies that have, uh, that have shown us this through history. COVID-19 is obviously not the first downturn. We had the post Y2K crash, 
2008 financial meltdown or going way back in history, we had the two world wars, the Great Depression in 1929 and so on. And uh, we have examples of Microsoft in 1975, 98, Google came, uh, launched in 98, 99 was Salesforce, or more recently, Airbnb in 2008. And over and over, all these companies were found, have shown that they uh, are founded during an economic downturn and emerge stronger by innovating through the down cycle. So, or even in the recent COVID, uh, an example is Target. While many retailers downed their shutters, Target moved more aggressively to a omni-channel, introduced same-day delivery, tweaked their categories, and grew more in 2020 than they had in the previous 11 years combined. So that shows the power of innovation and why the conversation, the question of innovation now during these, during these times. How is this all relevant to India? So uh, it's really, uh, what's happening now is really a coming together of three uh, key trends. First is the market dynamics which is driving an almost insane exponential pace of digital transformation. Companies, irrespective of their domain, vertical, have no choice but to jump all in or risk becoming obsolete. I think Nilesh in an earlier keynote quoted John Chambers as saying, 40% of companies would die in the next 10 years if they don't embrace digitization. So, just the market pressure is the number one factor. Second is customer readiness. Given this market dynamic and the acceleration of uh, digital disruption, customers are rushing in with 84% of CEOs agreeing that innovation is key to growth and longevity. And 94, but 94% 94 of the same CEOs are not satisfied or anywhere close to being satisfied with where their companies are today. So they're blocked by either lack of internal know-how, capability, lack of new talent, availability, and so on. They're hence now a lot more open uh, and in fact expecting innovation from all their points of presence around the planet and not just from HQ. So, and they're expecting this innovation from the internal captive centers and from external partners. And last uh, factor is India capability, thanks to the abundance of raw talent. Uh, we still have some work to do on the skills part, but we have 1.4 million engineers graduating from school each year. And we do have the innovation potential as demonstrated by 50,000 startups and 70 and counting unicorns. And we have the engineering capability with over 2,000 multinational engineering centers here. So uh, with all this, three factors coming in, now seems to be the right time for us to kind of build this innovation muscle and uh, for global context and not just for uh, not just for India but for really the global uh, global market. Now with that context, let's look at uh, this is a four quadrant, very popular standard innovation framework. So innovation obviously has different flavors. Bottom left as incremental innovation, what the original author called incremental innovation, where an existing technology is applied to an existing market to solve an open customer pain point or use case. And all the way to the top right uh, are where new technologies are applied to new markets to create new products. So we have this framework, we've seen this framework, and now if we were to superimpose this innovation framework to a business entity in India, this could be an independent company, a startup or a captive center of a foreign company, we see that innovation is probably a journey. The lowest hanging fruit for us in India is process and engineering efficiency to deliver effectively on a given charter. This is where we can start. This is the bottom left where we deliver on current charters. We focus on delivering efficiently on current charters. The next step, probably again, easy to uh, uh, theoretically easy because we don't really need to ask permission from anyone to do this is where we apply 
Um, this also applies, uh, by the way, to me to startups, many of which are successful unicorns because they innovated and out, -ex out executed existing players within a given market, within a current market. And so this is probably a step two for, for us in India. Third step is to innovate in adjoining areas. Given our increasing domain knowledge and increasing technical competency uh, and fluency in the domains that we have been operating in for so long. Uh, so this will be a logical next step where we apply existing technology where we have uh, now uh, seen as thought leaders, apply, applying them to adjoining areas. So uh, we do need to make an effort though uh, in this to increase our connect with customers to understand new use cases and emerging trends and applying our domain knowledge to solving new use cases in, uh, in these areas, in these new areas. And of course, finally the North Star for all, all of us in India and organizations across India is radical, what's called radical innovation, where we are applying uh, new muscle in technology to new products, to building new products for new markets. And uh, with this context, now let's see how we are doing, uh, how we're doing taking, uh, taking the India centers of global MNCs as an example. Zinov did a, a survey of uh, foreign multinational companies, including stakeholders uh, uh, in the headquarters and the India leaders of these companies. A big majority, what uh, was seen as uh, from the responses, a big, large majority, 85% in fact, are focused on delivering on current charters, right? So uh, this is in fact, and then on the, sa on the same uh, coin, I mean, in the same survey, three fourths uh, of the global stakeholders said their India centers are on par with their global centers in terms of productivity. But still the number one priority for 70% or three fourths, over three fourths of the India leaders was increasing productivity. Right, so uh, this is uh, such a concept, uh, context. Uh, given, given, the, uh, given the pace, again, given the market dynamics and that the global stakeholders are now expecting innovation from everywhere, uh, the survey went on, to, uh, went on to ask them about innovation and it was not surprisingly, two thirds or 65% of global stakeholders are now supportive or even expecting innovation from the India center. Right, so with all this, uh, now seems to be a great time to really uh, build and flex our innovation muscle from India. And uh, now with all this context on why now, let's look at, let's look at uh, uh, how this journey can happen, how this innovation journey happens. As we saw, innovation takes different forms across the portfolio of an enterprise. When we talk about innovation, muscle, uh, the muscles required are different for the different stages. To deliver well on a current charter or roadmap, the organization requires engineering excellence. Uh, and that's top of mind for all the leaders in India. Uh, to, uh, to innovate even within the current domain, current market, uh, going from engineering excellence, we need to start leadership and technology. So technology leadership is the next step. And then uh, we want to go into new adjoining markets. As you go into adjoining markets, customer centricity and deep domain knowledge become, uh, it become, become important. And then increasingly outside in thinking is critical to enable the organization to understand key markets, uh, technology trends, anticipate customer, emerging customer use cases and build relevant solutions. That's when, that's the North Star uh, that we've been looking at. And the time to build this muscle and deliver ROI from the investment uh, is obviously increases from left to right. And there are, across the entire spectrum of this innovation, the journey, the journey is no different than for a startup. Um, even if you're a captive of a multinational or an independent company, it's no different than what a startup goes through. We start by understanding the customer pain point or use case with lots of data, uh, ideate to design a solution, 
iterate until we achieve a problem solution fit, go to market and again iterate until we achieve product market fit and then scale up, scale up in the market. Not surprisingly, the tools required are not very that much different from uh, what a startup requires uh, either. Uh, but then uh, organizations cannot be accidental innovators. They have to be intentional about and want to, want to build this muscle. Uh, so building a culture of innovation requires serious intent. It starts with the tone at the top, clear articulation of the why, and the desired outcomes, which is the what, cascading that clear message down the organization, and reinforcing with a structured framework, programs, incentives, and key metrics. And on the slide are some examples of uh, uh, hackathon, spin-off, uh, new integration, but there are many, many, many more. And, but the main primary, uh, primary driver is uh, to be intentional about building this muscle and going about it in a structured way. And uh, having markers, having key indicators that shows that show progress towards the North Star and uh, measuring, our, measuring our success and the milestones along the way. So again, just to conclude, uh, this is a great time to build flex our innovation muscle from India in India. Uh, we have the market dynamics that's driving a rapid pace of innovation and digital disruption. We have the customers that are ready to adopt and in fact expecting innovation from everywhere. The capability in India is uh, increasing and uh, becoming more mature and we have the talent to back that up. All this, all this uh, uh, just aids in our ability to build our innovation muscle and uh, uh, not just and apply it, apply it to uh, solve global problems. So with that, uh, I'll uh, end now and uh, back to you, Divya. Thank you. Thank you, Amresh, for sharing those insights with us. That was pretty interesting. So you've got to be intentional. You have to go about it in a very, very structured way, and you need to measure uh, your success as you go. Uh, one of the questions that we've been having from the audience is that, um, organizations are being intentional and uh, they are trying to enable employees to innovate. But so far, we've not seen a lot of success with entrepreneurship. And uh, despite a lot of uh, measures that are taken, so what do you think is uh, really the challenge there? And why is it that we're not able to succeed with um, entrepreneurs? Okay. Um, I actually look at it differently slightly differently. Uh, so innovation is again an entire spectrum of innovation, but I think the companies in India and the India centers of multinationals are doing quite well in terms of delivering, in terms of engineering excellence and delivering on the current charters and maybe even innovating within the current charters, right? I mean, in software, you can you could go from point A to point B in 10,000, the most optimal solution or a better solution within the current charter. I think we're doing quite well. I think where we are struggling and we have not taken off really is innovating in new markets and in new products. I think again, it needs to be a, the, uh, we saw the results of the Zinov survey where it says 85% of the leaders are focused on just delivering on current charters. Whereas two thirds of global stakeholders expect innovation to happen. And in fact, demanding, requiring innovation to happen across all their centers. I think there the are a few key things for innovation, right? I mean, uh, for uh, either India companies or India centers, uh, start start small, baby steps, right? I mean, uh, start by innovating within the current charter and then expand to adjoining areas. So you build your muscle as you go along before you start saying, look, I'm gonna build a new product for a new market for the world, right? So that's that's key, I think. And um, I think we have the we have the capability we have the uh, we have the potential to do it. 
Great. Uh, that's super. So, so kind of build your muscle, have early wins, and then start moving on to uh, more areas. So that's super. Thank you so much, uh, Amrish. Thank you.